make sure your client knows you understand this and that you help the client work through. Let that client express their fear. And again, gang, it's not that the client is afraid of success. That is so stupid. They are terrified of failure. And sometimes when that client is confronted with that, it's easier to just give up and go back than try to do something you don't believe you can do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What's another issue right there then that you're focusing on? What was that? Probably one of the very first things we talked about way back in August. Self-efficacy. Self mm -hmm. Helping that client believe in self. <coughs> Help that client believe in that. You can do a lot of that. That's And the way you interact with, just the way you say things to the client and with the client and things like that. They've got to feel safe talking about this. When you said um, not afraid of success but terrified of failure, couldn't you relate that to outcome efficacy too, though? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Certainly. What is outcome efficacy? Everybody, yeah, everybody got that one. It's a big one. And what is self-efficacy is I believe I can. Remember, what was outcome efficacy? What did I talk about? I may believe I can. I can, I can do your treatment. I can do this. I can do, I can quit. You know, and, and really, <coughs> I can do this. The only problem is, the way it works out for me, no matter what I do, it ends up going bad anyway. It ends up shoved up my ass. Right. That, and that outcome. And gang, that can be as powerful mm -hmm. as self-efficacy. Once again, either way. I can't do it, why try? I can do it, but it's going to go bad anyway, why try? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Give up. That kind of a thing like that. Let that client feel safe. You've got, they've got to feel safe talking about this. <coughs> if the first time they talk about I miss my drug and you just rip them to pieces, you big damn fool or something. You see how that is so stupid and wrong? Mm -hmm. Right now, someplace, Within walking distance of this classroom, some idiot counselor is doing that to a client. What was this all about? This was a big one. That general adaptation syndrome? That was that general adaptation syndrome. Somebody help. What was that all about, you guys? Yes, sir. Uh, the loss of stress, if you were bored. That whole thing, because remember, how, yes, you're absolutely right. Normal stress. Of course, this place down here, what was this? No stress. What was this called? Dead. Dead. And then Saley's General Adaptation Syndrome. And this wasn't about addiction. Saley was, this was a model to help explain how and why we can become physically ill under stress. And how did that work? We divided that into three stages. Remember, how did that work? And here we're going along our stress level right here. And then something happens, whether it's a real tiger attack or some major bad thing in modern life or whatever else. And remember what happens at first that stress level dips and then it shoots up. Why does it dip? It, it's kind of, think of it this way. Before you can go from forward to backward, you gotta stop for a second, don't you? Mm -hmm. Shifting gears, if you will. Okay. That body, for just a split second, it's got to rearrange what it's doing. That that sudden, that powerful, and we're going to look at it, that, that sympathetic response. The sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And it kind of just, it, it, for just a split second, shuts down. Now, you've heard of, I mean, you're somebody who was, quote, scared to death. What if this thing dips so far and gets down to here? What is this? Dead. Dead. But, no, what the hell? We go up. What is this period right here? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. All of that energy goes up. Activation, arousal, and everything else. That sympathetic division. It makes all of the changes necessary for us to have the energy. Because back in the good old days, what was this about? This wasn't about 
some stupid modern problem you're pissed off or upset or somebody and you call you know, a poopy dog this was about what real tigers attack and so it elevated that energy in a way that what you could have the energy necessary to do what you needed to do to survive that tiger attack and then ideally you survive you do that you kill the tiger or at least you get away and then what then the what was that the parasympathetic brings that back down to where it should be that normal operating level but what if a person what if a person whether it's addiction or some i mean just uh, maybe some people their life it's one thing after another after another after another after another and then on top of that that damn thinking brain of ours where the next thing you know we're making tigers and all of a sudden, we're being all upset over things we don't really need to be all that upset about anyway. <laughs> and for that person, and again, addiction, that constant, I mean, gang, no, addiction every day is a constant struggle for survival. What did I say that one time, that counselor, I'm doing clinical supervision, and she said, my clients, I can't, they act like K-Man. And what did I say to her? Of course. You're right. What the hell do you... Every day in that addiction is an ongoing, unpredictable, usually dangerous, one way or another, full of stress, struggle for survival. Their body never gets a chance to go back down here. It stays up here. In fact, it's probably more like this. And the problem is, what is this stuff? Physiological chemistry, including neurochemistry. And just like, hey, what? how do drugs work? Hey, don't forget that message. What was it? How did it go? And helping that client, under, cocaine doesn't make you high. Mm -hmm. Norepinephrine and dopamine make you high. That's already inside you. It's that neurochemistry and how it's affected by the cocaine. But cocaine doesn't make you high. The things that make you higher are already inside. That alone is such a powerful message to people. It helps to demystify that drug. How many times I've had somebody say to me, my God, if only I had known this 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. Something like that. That chemistry. And just like drugs, what after you use them enough, we have what? Tolerance? There's tolerance at this level too. These neurochemicals. Pretty soon, this level of stress, this level of activation and arousal feels normal. So many counselors don't understand this. At some point, this begins to feel normal for that person. And then, for whatever reason, whether it's legal, family, this, that, or they just have had it enough themselves or whatever, at some point, they have that motivational thing and they decide, I want treatment, and one of the first things we do is we say, get back down here with your rest of us work and be happy. The serenity prayer. <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> and, and the problem is, this don't feel good for that person no more. They're used to this. This feels bad. And that person, they're going to be motivated to get that back and for for our people in early recovery what's one of the most convenient ways to get that back up there relapse use again you see what i'm saying and then gang i'm telling you and i've had counselors i've seen counselors that client comes in for their session and they relapsed and you ask what why did you relapse what happened and the client i was bored and that, you're what you're what you're telling me what you're going to sit here and tell me that you you do everything away you did this because you were bored do what again do i have stupid written on my forehead there's all full of shit you see what i'm saying with that guess what when they told you that probably <coughs> they were telling you the truth they were bored to the point of just stunning. It was driving them crazy. They had to get back up there, and the only way they knew how to do it was use again. And now we're denigrating that client for being a big, full of shit, dumbass. Are you gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you threw everything away. You gave it. You did for what? Because you were bored? Are you really that shallow and stupid? Boy, that's a good counselor, isn't it? 
<coughs> That's a real good counselor. I will hunt you down. No, they're probably telling you the truth. You need to be aware of this. You need to, who else needs to be aware of this? Client. Once again, the client, you guys. This is early, this is a big one. This is a big one, you guys. Threat to early recovery. You need to help, the, you need to help this client to understand this. And as a matter of fact, gang, we probably, well, if we deal with a lot of people, we're never gonna get them back down to here. One of your jobs will be, where is going to be their new place? A healthy new place for them. They may never get back down to the, uh, that place of normal with that. That brain doesn't like to let stuff go easy. This person's been doing this for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years or so. That brain is really good at that now. It doesn't... It, we may never get them back down. You need to understand this. See this. This is such a threat to early recovery. And they're going crazy. You need, you need, do you see how important this is? Now, Saley never talked about this. We're, we're once again, we're using Saley's model here. Most counselors, if you went to any of these drug treatment programs, unless they were a DAC student, and you started to talk to a counselor about this stuff, they'd look at you like, what the fuck are you talking about? You see what I'm saying? They wouldn't understand. They don't know this stuff. You need to know this. What a, do you see how this is a threat to early recovery? You need to understand this. Be aware of this. You need to help that client understand this. Be aware of this. You need to help this client. It's once again, because this client who is trying to feel good down here again, that's what they're supposed to be, that's what they told me, and everything else, and surrendering prayer, and everything else, I feel like shit, there must be something wrong with me. And there goes that. This also can exacerbate post-acute withdrawal. Help them understand. And ultimately, in their longer term treatment planning, and maybe they'll never get back down to here, we need to find some place in the middle for them. Does that make sense? This one, such a, you guys know this, understand this, never forget this stuff. Well, right thing, wrong time. One thing that counselors do is they try to do too much, too deep, too fast. You know, when I designed what became the phase project, which was a nine month long residential treatment program thing. Split it into three phases. Phase one was stabilization. Phase two was the core issues. Well, my ones and two, that stuff. My design calculus. Phase three was reentry, reintegration. Gang, when you guys, as you're reading this handout, another thing you're going to be looking at are the stages of assessment and stuff. Remember what was that? Diagnosis, intervention, termination, and stuff like that. And gang, this first phase, stabilization, <coughs> lasted for three months. Post acute withdrawal, all these other things. We've got to be aware of this stuff. And one of the things that my counselors understood by training, you don't start attacking this person with hedonic calculus ones and twos while they're in phase one. They're not ready for it yet. They need to get physiologically, medically, emotionally, psychologically ready for that before they're going to be... I hit you with this stuff too soon. It's a real thing. It does need to be talked about. I'm not saying we're going to stick our head in the sand. It needs to be dealt with when it's ready. How you doing? I'm Dan. Welcome to counseling. Oh, by the way, <coughs> you see, what I'm, and counselors, they sometimes they just they want to do too much too soon. Sometimes that's part of that time pressure thing. Right thing, wrong time. Bad timing of interventions, making people deal with. Gang, in my way of looking at this stuff, it does need to. Those ones and twos have to be dealt with. They are the fuel of this addiction. What's making that hedonic calculus worth it to them? 
And as long as it's worth it to them, they're going to keep doing it. They do need to be addressed, but at the right time. Now, maybe, no, in this day and age, we don't have the luxury of three months anymore. I know that. But still, you've got to be aware of this. And again, when we do what? And bad timing of interventions can be a real serious one. You are. Well, this feeds right into, once again, what, what, you know, the people that are against this past thing, a lot of the past just dredges up a bunch of shit and chases them out the door. Well, if you do it the wrong way, that is what will happen. If you do it the wrong way, that is exactly what will happen. That client needs to... No, we don't have the luxury, very little, seldom anymore, of three months for stabilization. But you still, you've got to be constantly, constantly, constantly assessing, reading this person. When are they going to be ready for this stuff? You need to look at emotional stabilization, psychological, hey, psychiatric stabilization, physical, medical, all that stuff. Be looking at They're still in the middle of drug dreams, and I want to talk to you about your childhood. You see what I'm saying with that? Things like that. You see what I'm saying with this stuff, you guys? Do you see how damn important this is? You embrace this stuff, you're going to be the counselors that know better. You're going to have fortunate clients who are going to reap the benefit of you caring enough to embrace this stuff and do it the right way. Does that make sense? It's so important, you guys. There's no book that's going to give you a timeline. Well, on this day, do that. On that day, do this. Because this is going to be very, very uniquely, idiosyncratically different for every person in that. It's just your ability to, once again, be there, feeling that client in a way that you can feel when it's ready. Does that make sense? And you start to push that stuff on that person too soon, it's going to chase them right out that door. Cool thoughts, questions, ideas with any of these. Bottom line basic counseling here. Wrong interventions. Another thing, not only, what was it? Well, we just talked about what's this? Right thing, wrong time. Right thing, wrong way. Just because the damn book said so. Just because that professor said so. Just because that clinical supervisor said so and I spell more beer than you drank it. Don't tell me what this is all about or anything like that. Gang, what did I say already? I can have six people with the exact same basic issue, but how I deal with that issue with each one of those people could be very different. I need to know that. How do I communicate? How do I this? How do I that? You see what I'm saying? Good example, we're going to be talking about next semester, paradoxical interventions, paradoxical intent, and what that kind of stuff is. In popular terms, it's called reverse psychology. You all know what I'm talking about. That stuff can be very clever and very helpful, but it can also be a what? A bomb waiting to go off of somebody's ass if you do it wrong. You see what I'm saying with that kind of stuff? We're going to be talking about that intervention stuff. Of course, in the counseling next semester. You may, with all of the best right intent and everything, you may even be on in terms of what the issue is here, but you're doing the wrong thing about it. And that is going to be a threat to early You see what I'm saying with this stuff, you guys? This is a big one. Be aware of this. What did I, somebody tell me, what did I mean? Flight to cure. What was that all about? Another threat to early recovery. What was that all about? Was this when somebody was in a hurry to be cured? Like, oh, I'm good. I, I'm done. This is thank easy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're so great. Mm. You're the best counselor. I can't yeah. believe this. I'm better. I'm done. I'm fixed. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done. I don't even need to come back. You are. You really are the best counselor in the world. I wish I had met you 20 years ago. This is the greatest thing in the world. Oh, I can't believe this. I am all fixed. Gang, that client, that's what they want. Who wants to fucking have to go to the fucking stupid meeting tonight? 
I want, who wants to have to sit there every day and dredge themselves through all this stuff and all this? They want to get better. Don't forget, why do people finally enjoy recovery? Because they want the good things life has to offer. I want it now. I've already lost the 12 years of my life to this damn addiction. I want to feel good now. I want, I want that happy now. I want that relationship now. I want this now. I want that now. I want to feel better now. I don't, I don't want to fucking go to another fucking meeting tonight. You see what I'm saying? I want that. And that's fine. They will convince themselves of that. I am better. I am fixed. I am cured. Isn't that kind of in line with what they refer to as the pink cloud? Like all of a sudden I'm feeling better. So yeah. like I'm, I'm good. That's it. And, and you're the best, you're the greatest. I wish I'd have seen you. I wish I'd have met you 10 years ago because I would, yeah, it's wonderful. Gang, this is, this is kind of where you got a little conundrum here. This client, and you're gonna see this recovery honeymoon. Yes, they're excited, they feel good. As a matter of fact, in Psych 250 right now, I'm talking about threats to internal validity. And one is, what, what was that called? Regression to the mean? Hey, your self-esteem is here. We've decided it needs to be here. I've measured you that first week on our counseling. It's right here. It needs to be here. I start the counseling. I measure you the second time we get together, and it's here. Aren't you lucky? You must have the best damn counselor in the world. Except the next time I measure it, it's here. What the hell happened? Nothing really except for what we call regression to the mean. In other words, this was an artificial score in the first place. What did that represent? I'm finally doing something about it. I'm finally taking action. I'm finally feeling good about something. I'm finally this, I'm finally that. You see what I'm saying with that? And that score. They went from here to there. That, that's not bad. Don't get too bent out of shape with this. Do you see what I'm saying? This is not probably an accurate score. It was that recovery honeymoon. It was that I'm really feeling good. I'm doing something here. So it's a momentary state. Of it, it's, it's, yes. It's, it's artificial. And then the next time you measure it, it's back down here and you wonder what the hell happened. Nothing happened. This is probably a much more accurate measure in the first place. Here's the conundrum, you guys. That client, and they're feeling all good and all excited. And there's a lot of what feels like positive momentum energy behind this. I mean, you don't want to be a big negative Nelly and just throw it, ah, settle the call down. You see what I'm saying? It's, it, you want to encourage that, but at the same time, you got to be careful. <coughs> guess what? This is probably not real. And if you, what did I say one time? What was that? Don't over celebrate. Mm -hmm. Remember that concept? From Don't give extra. This is a place where you got to be careful. Be careful over celebrating. This is probably artificial. And if you let that client run with it, the next thing you know is here. The next thing you know is here. The next thing you know, they don't need anything anymore. And guess what? And oh, by the way, I can probably go back to that bar too, because I got this licked. I get to go back to the bar and hang out with my friends, and I don't have to worry, I'll never drink again because I got this licked. This flight to cure can be a real serious. You got, and, and again, that, that cannot, you don't want to be a big negative and, you know, and, you know, shoot down their balloon, but at the same time, you know, how do you cash in on that positive energy without letting it go the wrong way? Does that make sense? Last semester, you said to, to help ask them how they feel. Help about where they're at. In, in other words, what we want is we want that to move from external to internal yeah. locus of control and reward. Well, in this case, over celebrating, and I've seen counselors, I mean, it's seductive for the counselor. Damn, I'm good. Wow, look at, look at, did you see my patient? You know why? That's how good I am. I am the best. Wow, it feels good to be that good. So this can be seductive for the counselor too. And the next thing you know, they're running off with that and that client, that flight to cure. And they're not that, they're not that. Yet. And then the next thing you know, see what I'm saying with that? Mm -hmm. Be careful with this one. And it is, it's, it's a sticky wicket, if you will. 
How do you get this person more rationally centered without being a big stick in the mud? A big negative. You see what I'm saying? How do you do that well? Keep this person rationally centered. Well, a big one, external interruptions, use environment problems. Unless this is a residential program, which is becoming more and more rare every day. And even in, even in residential, this can happen. But gang, just because you decided to stop using drugs, just because <laughs> you went into treatment or going to that meeting, Bought that big book doesn't mean life stopped. And it doesn't mean that you still owe. Or that you don't still owe. Amarin. Three months back. Bills. It doesn't mean that you still have to answer that legal problem. Those things are still there, you guys. And what is, what's the term we use? I talked about this a little bit. and It's on here too, but it, it can fit here also. What was that called? Heaven's reward fallacy. fallacy. Somebody tell me what that is. Yes, sir. Like when you start doing good, so you think good things should start happening. You know what? I'm doing the right thing here. Why the fuck can't they understand that? Amarin doesn't care. And it's not your right to expect that they will. You have to help that client stay centered with this. And life is still happening, and there probably are still. Just because you're going to treatment now, just because you, doesn't mean. Remember this whole pile of things in the hedonic calculus? <laughs> They're still there. And that person can become so focused on this, they forget why those things are there in the first place. And, and again, it's just, and I want to solve this problem. I want to solve this problem. Besides that, now look at what I got this. And that person, number one, they can start to feel so overwhelmed. No, I mean, look at this pile of crap they got going here. Do you remember this in the Hedonic Calculus? Now, before they stopped using, that stuff didn't matter because they were too loaded to care about it. That's one of the good reasons to be loaded in the first place. Now, all of a sudden, they're not loaded no more. They get to think about and worry about all that shit. And then new stuff comes along. And then this and then that. And then the next thing you know, just when I thought me and the wife were getting along, finally, she gives me the divorce paper. And then this, and then that. And then dad died, and then this, and then, you see what I'm saying? And those things can short wire real quick. That motivation, that positive energy. You have to help this client. I, again, I help this client, right? And that's the first day, it's not, hi Dan, let's take a look at, or hi I'm Dan. Welcome to treatment. Let's look at this. But as soon as help this client get in touch with this, help this client from the start have a rational, centered understanding of what this deal is right now. And it's we got some problems here. I'm not talking about the hedonic calculus ones and twos problems here and stuff. The counseling issues. I'm talking about right here. Guess what? Life is still happening, and you got some stuff here. How did we help that client stay rationally centered in their expectations, in their priority setting, in their ability to manage these realities without letting them overwhelm them and defeat? Because gang, even that motivate, just like that, just like that relationship is, <coughs> that motivation is fragile right here too. Yes, I want to. Yes, I want to. Yes, I yeah, 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 yeah. But at some point, you know what? Enough is enough. And in the beginning, that's not that far down the road. That's a very fragile motivation. Okay, clients, be aware of this stuff, you guys. Did 
again. Guess what? Would you read that last those last three words of that number nine proof to me? Use. It's use, not used, right? Use. Okay, thank you. Use environment kinds of thing. I, I understand. That's and that's another right. thing, you guys. Very often in early recovery, another issue is poltergeists from your old using days. Hey, where you been? For I heard you were in treatment. Welcome home. Hey, it's good to see ya. Hey, listen, let's celebrate. Let's go party. Or other things like that. I swear to God, if somebody said that to me, I'd punch them in their face. If I just got out of treatment and they said that to me. It happens all the time. That's crazy. Let's go celebrate because you're done with treatment. Part of God. part of you guys, and another thing we'll be looking at, how many people have heard of ASAM? ASAM is the standardized way of trying to figure out and match a client with the best level kind of an intensity of care. And it, it, one, one of the most important predictors, one of the most number one important predictors of a successful treatment is getting to the right place and the right kind and intensity of care to start with. And ASAM is a system that kind of helps us figure that out. You see, where does this person need to be in their in treatment? What level of care? What kind of care? How much intent? That kind of thing like that. And one of the major things that ASAM looks at is their person's use environment and their home environment. Once again, they're an intensive outpatient. <coughs> they're spending all day long doing all, all kinds of good therapeutic things, singing Kumbaya and all this other stuff. But guess what? Tonight, they got to go home to that empty apartment. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they got waiting for them is that another dirty letter from Amarin and the people in the apartment next door are partying and having a good time while well, you got nothing but reruns of the Golden Girls all night long. Now let's see how that rubber hits the road. That kind of, see, that kind of stuff like that, looking at that reality. Again, the issues of internal external motivation. Internal external motivation. We talked about this one. This is one of the biggest, stupidest fights that counselors have in the beginning with their client talk is, are you here for the right reasons? What are you here for? I'm here because I don't want my wife to leave me. That's the wrong reason to be here, you dumbass. I'm here because I don't want to go, what is wrong with not wanting my wife to be mad at me? What is wrong with not wanting to go to prison? Do you hear what I'm saying with this time? <coughs> What's wrong with that? Not a damn thing. You're here for the wrong reason. Gang, most people, this is a terrifying thing in the first place. Most people do consider and eventually begin movement toward recovery because of secondary gain. Because they want what? This stuff to go away. This is why they start treatment. Well, that's not the right reason. They gotta want it here. They want to do the right thing for the right reason. They did. It's gotta be inside them. Kinda of that's right. In the long run. You want this to be an intrinsically motivated set of behaviors that begin to manifest into the, from the addiction survival persona to the what? Recovery survival. Recovery survival persona. You do want, at some point, the right things for the right reasons. You do want this to feel. That's why when don't over celebrate. And when that person does say, I just, I, I, you know what? I had this really high risk thing and I didn't drink. Oh, fantastic. Give me a hug. Oh, that is the greatest thing. Oh, I'm so proud of you. No, instead, instead of all that external reinforcement, how did that feel inside? How, do, how, was, how was that in here? Yeah, that kind of stuff. But in the beginning, you guys, 
It is external. It's a secondary gain stuff. Embrace that. They're here for the wrong reason. And unless you get your hand out of your ass and be able to raise it again, it's not going to work. You need to pull the hand. Tell us right now that's happening to a client. Some idiot moron counselor is saying it to a client right now. You see what I'm saying with that? No, yes, gang. Once again, it's one of these issues of what? Well, right thing, wrong time. Right thing, wrong way. Well, right thing, wrong motivational. In the beginning, take advantage of those external reinforcers and motivations and reasons. And besides that, what is wrong with not wanting to go to prison? What is wrong with not wanting to lose my job? What is wrong with not with not wanting to lose my favorite fishing boat? Oh, you're so shallow. You're so fun. You see what? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with not wanting to lose my motorcycle? Nothing. And if that's where that energy is in the very beginning, use it. Don't fight it. Eventually, yeah. What do we want? We want this to morph into internal. Internal locus of control. Intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic reward. Yes, it's going to be one of these longer term. We'll move it that way, but in the beginning. And if you start fighting that client about that from the very start, it's a sure, sure shot to fuck you. I'm out of here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Big risk. Are you guys... Are you seeing the importance of this stuff? Do you see the difference of what the good versus bad counseling? And the, and maybe if more people started to look at this stuff, maybe we don't have to feel like such big shots at 18% anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We're going to continue with this. I also want you to read your biology thing as we, well, probably will be meeting on Thursday, I expect. John, I need to see you real quick for a second. Uh, a couple things. And then, now, do you have the biology thing? Biology. Yeah. I got the key. I'm like, I'm like, oh my god. I think I got the key.